All righty. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and kick it off? Uh, I will just give a brief overview. Today is Thursday, August 26th. We are just a couple of days away from our new student move-in day and the start of a new semester. So campus is looking vibrant, beautiful, and it is nice and toasty and sunny Salem right now. Uh, I am Greg Hanlon, uh, class of 2011. I work in our alumni and family relations office. I am gonna be your host tonight. Uh, so I just want to take a moment to welcome everyone to our NOAC Live series. Uh, we are really excited about the program we have tonight. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to let you know that you are viewing on YouTube, and you can use the chat feature to ask questions for our presenters. Uh, once the presentation is complete, we will still attempt to answer as many questions as we can. So as, as you know, it's being recorded and will be available on YouTube channel for future viewing as well. So if you didn't catch the full thing or wanna rewatch it later, you'll have that opportunity. Um, as well as all other NOAC Live events that we've previously hosted will be uh, featured on uh, our YouTube channel as well. And if you wanna look at more resources that we have, you can just check out the Alumni Hub. Just visit roanoke.edu slash alumni and they'll be uh, on there. So without further ado, I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, welcome our guests. We're so excited to be celebrating International Dog Day. So for all of you dog lovers, I hope you're uh, maybe getting a puppuccino or doing something special for, for your pet friends. Um, so we are joined today by Roanoke College faculty member, Dr. Chris Lee and his wife, Christina. Uh, and we're going to learn a little bit more about their nonprofit organization called Deaf Dog Rock. Uh, so Dr. Chris Lee has been a member of the mathematics faculty at Roanoke College since 1994. The same year he and his wife, Christina, met both transplanted Midwesterners. Chris moved to Salem after completing his Ph.D. in mathematical sciences at Clemson. Go Tigers. Uh, while the role of head designer for Sydney's brought Christina to Roanoke after completing her, her Bachelor of Fine Arts at VCU. Their, their mutual love of animals led them to adopting their first dog, Nitro, in 2010. Neither could have predicted that their passions for animal welfare, welfare and community service would lead to the formation of a national nonprofit, Deaf Dogs Rock, an organization that now has an active community of 75,000 and growing. Deaf Dogs Rock has financially sponsored over a thousand deaf dogs into the safe harbors of rescue and facilitated the adoption of over 4,000 deaf dogs. Education and community outreach are key components of the organization's mission, a pursuit which keeps both Christina and Chris busy as they enjoy life on their farm in Salem. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Uh, first, please tell us a little bit more about Nitro and, and how he helped start Deaf Dogs Rock. Great. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for welcoming us. And hello, everyone. It's uh, great to see you virtually. And um, it, it's, it's such a fun story because, uh, I mean, Christina and I have been dog people our whole lives. And it was back in 2010, we had a call from a good friend who ran the Salem Animal Shelter and their animal control had picked up a scrawny little dog down by the river. They discovered it was deaf. We're thinking it could it probably we should have a special home. She thought of us and reached out to us and we had never even thought of deaf dogs. So uh, we talked a bit. We weren't really looking to get another dog, but whoever really is, right? There's like potato chips, we always say. And um, so we adopted Nitro and uh, he was our first wanted to be responsible. We started reading, we started going to local training classes. And um, what it, I guess if I fast forward a little bit, it can be a long story as I wind through it, but how it led to the organization was, um, we discovered this great kind of need, oh, that dog sees something, this kind of great need and interest. We had a couple of media stories covering our training of Nitro using American Sign Language. Emails started lighting up, people started reaching out, and Christina was getting into blogging at the time, and uh, 
it was just a really natural fit to think that, well, maybe we could be the ones who could help provide information for other deaf dog owners. We hadn't found much on our own at that time. There wasn't a lot out there. And so we'll talk more as the hour progresses about all the different things we do, but we kind of stumbled into it and then it just got a hold of us. Yeah. So, it keeps us pretty busy. Yeah. So uh, talk, to, talk to us a, a little bit about um, owning a, a deaf dog for the first time and, and maybe a little bit about the training that you guys did. Well, um, we, of course, the first 24 hours was kind of a realization that we have no idea what we're doing with Nitro here um, because he was fairly detached. He didn't really look at us. You couldn't get his attention. And so Chris kind of talked me off the ledge on that one where he said, you know what, we'll, we'll go and get positive reinforcement training. And so we signed up at the Field of Dreams Training Center in Benton, and it was their very first deaf puppy that they've ever had. And uh, we took Nitro to classes. I mean, he started at 12 weeks and he finished around a year. He got his um, Canine Good Citizen Award by 10 months. So he just soared through the car and he loved learning things. Um, he just lit up and he just loved learning things. So that was kind of the start of it. Anything that we could get our, our hands around as far as positive reinforcement training, we were like sponges. We were just trying to learn everything we could. Well, and Greg, I should complete the introductions here as well, right? This is our young Boston Terrier, Marshall. And we may talk more about his puppy bowl exploits. And this is Bowie over here, who's about five years old. And they're uh, both completely deaf and uh, not completely common in Boston Terriers, but to kind of preempt one of your questions, what you find is dogs that are low in pigment have a much higher incidence of being deaf. And so when you see dogs with like the Boston Terriers, a lot of white on their faces, white boxers, white pit bulls, Dalmatians with few spots, white cats, white horses, any animal along that line runs a higher chance of being deaf. Right. So that's what we see a lot. Right on. Uh, we got one comment. I'll, I'll read it briefly just because it's uh, from an alumna in, who is watching on YouTube, Jessica Bricky. Um, she said, Dr. Leah had you for calculus uh, <laughs> in 2005. Um, she's excited to hear about your other life as an animal advocate and was excited to see one of your dogs on this year's Puppy Bowl. Hey, hey, excellent. So uh, kind of transitioning a little bit, Christine, would you mind sharing a little bit more about um, the formation of the blog and how that kind of led you to Deaf Dogs Rock? Well, you know, I was blogging um, uh, I had a little miniature pincher named Lexi. And of course she went to Roanoke college for almost 15 years with Chris. I take her to school every day. Yeah. Every and uh, so I would, I used to have a blog named the world according to Lexi. And I would just share photos of around the farm and of our dogs. And a lot of times I would go to different shelters and take pictures of dogs that needed to be adopted. So it kind of all started from there, just kind of lear learning the blog wor world and, uh, met a lot of other bloggers. And then with Deaf Dogs Rock, there were so many limited resources. I just looked at Nitro one day and I just thought there are deaf dogs and shelters across the country that are being put to sleep for the simple fact that they're deaf. And I just felt like we had to do something about that. And that's really how we launched Deaf Dogs Rock to not only, you know, share our education with families with deaf dogs, but we work with shelters all over the country, um, teaching their volunteers how to train deaf dogs. We list their deaf dogs available for adoption. And then on urgent um, dogs that are about to be put to sleep, we will sponsor them. And we have 10 partner rescues that are special needs rescues. We will sponsor them out of the shelter into a rescue where they can find a home and get the training they need. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Dr. Lee, I understand that you've been known to bring your dogs to work with you and that you have used your organization data for classes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, some alumni may have met Lexi, as Christina said, you know, 
three deaf dogs. I had uh, our little min pin Lexi and she sat in the corner of my office and for 15 years she came in every day and uh, I swear more students came to see her than me, which was totally fine. Anything to get conversation, get students in the door. But um, what, what we've done with the deaf dogs, it's a really neat interaction. You know, many of the alumni are aware that, you know, we have our I and Q series of courses in our general education and all of those are theme based and you want to look at a topic, investigate it, motivate the knowledge that we're trying to learn. And uh, for instance, one of my colleagues, Adam Childers, his statistics course is oh. the honors version of it. They are always looking at analyzing data and not just doing it for the, so we have lots of, so it may come and go. They're looking for real world applications and students, engage so much more with the concepts and they're seeing how it's applied. So what I do is <laughs> hang on a second, we'll get we'll get more loud for you guys. <laughs> so what um so what we do with Adam's class, it's wonderful. They're looking for data to analyze. And I give them all our analytics data from our Facebook page. So social media, love it or hate it, I think one of the most redeeming qualities is an animal rescue, allowing people to reach out to see animals, to fundraise. Facebook is our single largest fundraising medium right now. But uh, we're posting all the time. We're looking for maximum engagement. We're looking for maximum reach. So the students in Dr. Childers class look at the data and as their project, they analyze the data, they look at the different criteria, what increases our reach, when should we advertise, that type of thing. And they write reports trying to make a difference in lives of dogs. And so at the kickoff of the project, I always bring one of our dogs in and talk all day and talk for an hour to the students and they love it. And it, it, it's such a neat, a neat example, I think, of this kind of experiential learning we want in this kind of real world where we could just teach really, yeah, I can just shotgun statistics at you and here's everything you need to know. But when you see it actually in play, I think the students, it really resonates well. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that is really a, a true example of experiential learning <laughs> at, at its greatest and, and kind of what what makes Roanoke different. That's that's yeah. awesome. Um, we understand that um, you also have a dog named Marshall who caught a lot of public attention recent, recently. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about that story? Sure. So many of you are familiar with the Puppy Bowl. Puppy Bowl, this was its 17th year, I believe. Uh, Animal Planet started it as just some kind of tongue-in-cheek fun programming to counter-program for the Super Bowl. And you, most of you have seen it as dogs running around and if they grab a toy and run into the end zone, you get a touchdown and it's a fun event that goes on all day. But um, what the Puppy Bowl really focuses on, what Animal Planet does is uses that event to raise awareness of rescue dogs. Shelter. So shelter dogs. So all the dogs that you see in the Puppy Bowl are from shelters all around. Some travel a good distance, some are from the Northeast, from, from down here and they represent, they try to get all different breeds. They are, have a great interest in special needs dogs mm -hmm. as well to increase awareness, to increase adoption likelihood. So shelters that are interested in participating submit applications. And that one of, <laughs> one of our partner rescues, uh, Green Dogs Unleashed up in Charlottesville sends a couple dogs every year to the puppy bowl and so they sent Marshall in and he got selected to play and it was a blast uh COVID made it a little harder they we actually had to do all these interesting handoffs where at the time it filmed which was the fall late fall of 20 I guess uh out-of-staters couldn't even come into New York and stay so the dog had to be handed off to a local rescue who would take it and they rented a huge hockey arena and filmed over three days and edited it all together but um it was a lot of fun it, it gave our organization some great recognition which we always love we you know it, every every donation every click every interaction helps the dogs that we're trying to help and uh 
Marshall himself was a rock star. He, prior to the Puppy Bowl, they had a popularity contest where <laughs> it was a single elimination, just like your, you know, your basketball tournament. And um, it was four weeks. He has four weeks of voting. It was very smart PR on their part to get people engaged in the weeks leading up to it. But Marshall ended up winning that. So he won the most popular. And then during the game, he uh, scored the first double yep. touchdown, right? He picked up a toy, ran into the end zone, ran out of the end zone, and ran back in the end zone. <laughs> so it's hilarious that, you know, how much fun they had with that. But he ended up winning MVP. Uh, MVP so most valuable player, most valuable puppy for the Puppy Bowl. So it was pretty cool. He uh, had a great day. And it was at a time, especially this year, a time in the world where everybody was a great day off from the headlines and everything going on. And just to uh, see the puppies play and I'll be the first to admit it's the first time I actually watched the whole puppy ball all the way through. And it was a lot of fun, but for a lot of people, it's what you switch through and see. So that was fun. So uh, what was it like kind of preparing for the puppy bowl? Did you and Marshall spend a lot of time in the Craigers Center <laughs> working out? Back, you know, at the time we, we uh, he wasn't with us yet. We um, had, he had come out of a situation, needed to be rehomed. Our partner rescue had taken him in, was doing the vetting, the spay and neutering. And we had decided to adopt him, but our rescue partner wanted to keep him for another couple of weeks until they sent him up. So her organization could take him to the puppy bowl. So it's kind of the puppy bowl is kind of a joint thing between us. At the time, he was representing Green Dogs Leash and the show Deaf Dogs Rock, us as the adopters of, they did a little bio of his adoption story. So we knew going in, I tell you, Greg, what was hard is that they filmed in like September or something. And we couldn't tell October. anybody. It was, yeah, it was October. October. Was October. We couldn't tell anybody until it aired in February. They filmed it so far in advance and they didn't but, want word to sneak out about who was in it. So we couldn't even tell people he was in the public but, but also to your initial question of did did they work with them to get him ready? They Green Dogs Unleashed did a great job. They taught him the agility course. They worked with him a lot on um, obstacles and running and watching and playing and doing all, they interacted him with other dogs. And then actually the um, Animal Planet um, team did come to Green Dogs Unleashed and they did a special story about Marshall um, because uh, Kevin Proctor is a nurse. That's uh, the director's husband. And so they showed, um, him going to the hospital and seeing uh, frontline workers. They and, took Marshall. Yeah, so they did a very special side story on him, and Green Dogs Unleashed did a really good job on all that, and I know they worked really hard on it. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, we'll have to talk to uh, our athletic department and see if we can get Marshall <laughs> inducted into the Hall of Fame. That's a, that's yeah, a yeah. So, uh, cool. looks like we got. Um, one more comment. I just want to make sure I read these as they come in, just so you know that uh, you have some of your former uh, class uh, students in, in the chat. We have uh, Emily Gino Gale, who is a 2017 alumna. She had you for statistics in fall of 2016. Fall, and love. She's a big fan. So Yay. thank you for coming by. So um, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, Talk to, talk to us a little bit about what, what types of homes do deaf dogs need? Well, I think with deaf dogs, I think there's a misconception that there's that much different. And they really, they're dog first, they're breed second, and they're deaf third. So we take all those things into consideration first. And so they need just a loving home, someone committed to doing um, the positive reinforcement training and socialization and being an advocate for the dog to keep it safe. Um, you know, so it's it's not for the faint of heart. You, you look for somebody that's really committed, um, you know. We, we like to say to people, it's not it's not harder, it's just different. And so, you know, the, the, the most glaring difference is gonna be they don't hear you. And so we promote and provide a lot of educational materials on how we try to use traditional American sign language. And it's so much fun when you run, a, you know, run into a deaf person somewhere or someone who knows sign language and they can ask your dog to sit or come over and do these types of things. But, um, and then there's some extra considerations, you know, we really stress fenced yards and things like that, because if 
a deaf dog is off leash and running away from you, you got nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, which is true so, with a lot of hearing dogs is, you know, too. So, but yeah. But they've been, you know, we're we're as you can guess, we're just a little bit biased. But you know, we absolutely prefer deaf dogs now, and. Uh, you know, we've, we've made some fun shirts about, you know, 10 reasons why deaf dogs rock. But uh, when you get your first thunderstorm or fireworks event and your dogs are just passed out and sleeping through it, it's like, okay, this is all right. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of things that um, are, are kind of nice that when we're out in public and we can be in, you know, more busy downtowns or, you know, we were down at Dr. Pepper Park at a really loud concert and the dogs are both passed out sleeping, you know, yeah. they're just... Uh, so, so there are some kind of really neat perks to it, I would say. Yeah, Emily just uh, uh, asked the question in the chat, which is, it, which is uh, you know, kind of relevant to what you're, you're talking about right now, but what, what parts of your daily life had, have you had to adapt uh, with deaf dogs? Well, 100% of mine. Yeah. <laughs> because everything I do, my work, and, you know, we have, we have six dogs here and most of them are deaf. So um, my job is to make sure that they're happy and uh, they get a lot of playtime and they get training. And then I spend the rest of my time either on Deaf Dogs Rock. I get hundreds of emails a day that I have to answer and training questions and you know how to rehome a dog and things like that. And now we even have um, a huge deaf community that are adopting deaf dogs. So we have a new trainer on our website that she teaches uh, positive reinforcement training and she supplies the videos for us and it's all in American Sign Language. Wow. Oh yeah, that's a whole new thing. Yeah, so uh, for me, it's 100%. Uh, yeah, and I think for an average deaf dog owner, I think that you wanna be a little more responsible in the training stage because Deaf dogs, not as a rule, but they can develop separation anxiety and feel more alone when they can't see you. So we really yeah. heavily promote well done crate training. So they see the crate as a wonderful place. So if you do have to go to work for a longer shift or things like that, the dog, they can feel more isolated when they're not getting the stimulation. And uh, again, it's just get you know positive conditioning. And um, that's mainly what we encourage people if you just put the work in up front for the first year such a great dog and such a great experience for so long and that but you know every, almost everything you're hearing us say applies to all dogs, all dogs. They can hear all dogs. we probably just stress it more well and dogs. we always say we became a lot better of a dog family because we had to step up and be more responsible and we hadn't yeah. we had dogs before but we didn't go to training or we didn't know any of that so i think it made us a better dog family for yeah. sure yeah. yeah so from your experience are there any favorite stories that come to mind when working with your dogs oh with our, with our dogs and with other people um no, i think I, nitro yeah. learning nitro we were doing a lot of uh, pet expos with Nitro. So we were, you know, trying to uh, bring awareness to how great deaf dogs are. So um, Nitro and I took an agil agility for fun class. And so we taught him to go over the, you know, go over the jumps, go through the tunnel. And once he figured it out, he just looked at myself and the trainer and he, he would just run the whole course over and over like that light bulb went off and, it, and he had so much joy whenever you taught him a new sign and he figured out what it meant that light bulb would come on and you just see the joy in his face and I, I will always remember that day it was pretty cool uh, uh, you know we often refer to deaf dogs as Velcro dogs. I think in many ways they can develop a stronger bond with their families um, they're so tuned into watching you and staying locked on you and relying on you, I think, for some of the communication that, like with Nitro, he's always just looking for the next signal. What should I do? What should I do? Just wanting to please. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. I think, you know, it, it's like I joked about earlier, the fall and asleep, you know, we'll be walking around outdoor fest or go fest and things like that. And I'll be carrying Bowie and he'll just be passed out sleeping. But it's it just, 
they wonder how is your dog doing that you know why aren't they so reacting we, so, we, we socialize yeah. them at, when they're puppies too yeah. so we take them everywhere when we get a new deaf dog we take them everywhere with us yeah. so they're they they just they get to know different people different dogs yeah. different situations try yeah. to mix it up a lot and that you know i mean on the topic of favorite stories you know what I think what makes what we do so rewarding is seeing a lot of the adoption stories, you know, like Chris, like you mentioned in our intro, we, we do two primary things. One of our most successful things right now, we just did our 1000th dog is it's very common. And again, sorry to ramble a bit here, but when you hear the word shelter, municipal, that type of thing, it generally implies city, county, state, and they can't do as Screen. screen is they have you know they're more they equal screen. they can't screen for certain owners the dogs are much more likely to possibly be euthanized so what we do a lot is hear of dogs that are in quote danger or need to get out of a given shelter and what christina's built with our network on facebook and other social media she'll put a call out are there any 501 rescues near San Antonio that could take in this dog. And we will we'll, Yeah, we'll provide a couple hundred dollars in medical and intake sponsorship because no rescues are sitting on piles of money. So we fundraise very hard so we can pass this along. And a couple hundred dollars allows the rescue to take in the dog, give it the medical attention, the training, the nutrition it needs, which just puts the odds of it finding a permanent home through the roof. And so we do a lot of this sponsoring there. And, and then we get to hear a lot of the fun stories. I mean, just last week, we had a, a wonderful deaf puppy we were working with. The family who adopted it had lost a deaf dog a couple of years ago. They were very experienced with it, but they had a young son who was deaf and they were adopting it for him. And um, those are probably some of the most heartwarming ones we ever see when the families adopt the deaf dog and they have a deaf child because the bond between them is just so instant and beautiful and complete. It, it's uh, it's not like an adult trying to retrain how to think about interacting with a deaf dog. It's just second nature and it's beautiful. So those are some of our, our favorite, I think, stories we run across. Yeah, that's awesome work you guys are doing for, for not only our community, but so many other communities as well. Um, we've, we've had a couple questions come through and um, I'll continue to, to, to hit some of these. Um, Jessica asked, uh, many people get a dog for a sense of security or protection. Are, are deaf dogs able to sense intruders or, or things like that? Yeah, you know, one of the things, and it, this is true probably of all you know, humans, anything, when you lose one sense, the others often get incredibly heightened or are much more attuned to them. So, um, you know, I mean, sometimes our deaf dogs are slacking a bit. If they're tired, we'll come home and they'll be sacked out on the couch and we'll get all the way in. But um, at other times, you know, it, what, what defies a little bit of logic is, you know, what, like you heard our boxer barking. That was a car. He can't see he can out, feel it. but that was a car probably a good 400 feet away driving by on the road. He can feel the vibration. So they're that tuned into the vibration. And um and we have a mixture. We have a couple of hearing dogs, and it's funny. The deaf dogs really look to them for cues. If the hearing dog hears something and barks, the deaf dog picks up on that and goes to it. But uh, I think you know that they do a great job. You can catch them sleeping on the job every now and then. You know, if they're truly out cold, they may not be not the warning alarm you want. But, we do um, have a we do have a hearing chihuahua, and he's like a little he's like ten pounds little guard dog. And yeah. so when his hackles go up and he starts barking, he he'll go up and wake him up. Yeah. He'll jump on him, like yeah. get up, do your job. So yeah. there's always that. But we've seen wonderful stories of deaf dogs, you know, w with their increased senses detecting fires, waking families. You know, we, we see it all of all sorts of dogs. Drug but, dogs. You know, too. We've, uh, yeah, we've right on. We had a uh, we had another couple questions come through. One is about uh, communication with deaf dogs. How much sign language uh, competency is, is needed? Oh, very little. You know, you can get as fancy as you want, but, you know, well, a, half dozen, a half dozen to a dozen, you know, hand signs, whether it's sit down, stay, come here, want to go for a walk, want to go for a ride. Um, what, what What's 
probably the most important thing is not that you're using exact specific ASL. That's, that's nice, but you don't have to. It, mm-hmm. it, it teaches you consistency because dogs are so much more visual than auditory anyways. You may think you're talking to your dog and giving them all these fancy commands, but they're really noticing that your brow is furrowed and your hands are on your hip and you yeah. look unhappy. Yeah, yeah. So they're really, dogs are so cueing into us physically that adding to that, you're asking them to sit down, you're asking them to stay. It, it's, we, we've seen dogs that excel, and Marshall's going through a lot of training right now for agility, but there's dogs that know hundreds and hundreds of commands and do amazing deaf dog things. And, uh, and there's probably plenty of deaf dogs homes where the people have a half dozen and that's all they need to have a wonderful, yeah. happy, safe dog. And we yeah. provide that on our website. If you go yeah. to our training blog, you, it, there's beginning sign language, beginning signing. And so we have the video that shows you all the commands. Yeah. We have the ASL charts up so you can learn. Um, so we try to make it really easy. And another, you know, Greg, to that, and um, one thing we always try to point out is that, and this is a bit of a generalization, but it's almost perfectly true. Every dog will go deaf if it lives long enough. It's very hard to find a 13, 14, 15 year old dog that hasn't lost its hearing. It's almost universal among dogs. So we encourage all dog owners to start doing, to just be aware of what they're doing because their dogs are queuing in on that. If they're using some hand signs, even when they have the hearing dog, then later in life, if the dog does go deaf, you have, um, they're all set up for it already. And so. That's a good point. So I, I have, I have a rescue and he's probably getting up into eight, nine, 10 range. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm just guessing based on what the, what the rescue had, where, where would a person start if they were going to start with the signing? I think you just start with your, like when you go to feed him, you would just go time to eat, time to eat, just simple things. Like when you take him out to go potty point to the door. So start pointing like we've got a 13 year old and she went deaf this year and I don't know how long she was deaf for. She could have been deaf for a year because she was so tuned into our sign language that she was, her directional training was off the charts. And then one day I was trying to wake her up. She can't hear anything, but who knew? Uh, Yeah. I mean, Greg, what you might start doing is just kind of miming out what you're saying. If you're asking the dog to come here, you know, to start thinking of the hand signs you would put along with that. And what was, you know, another advantage of the signing is that it can cross distance a lot better than your voice can. You don't so, have to get up from the couch. Yeah. So from across the room, we can, you know, tell the dog to sit down and they'll sit and stay. And it's really nice. You don't have to yell. <laughs> but, um, yeah. You know, I'll have to check out your website. And, and speaking of that, can you, can you talk a little bit about how you've used social media and some of those uh, areas uh, to your advantage when uh, boosting your program? Well, our social media is everything. I mean, um, just our our Facebook page that has 75,000 followers, a lot of those are dog, dog families. And so... Um, they're our biggest supporters financially, emotionally. Um, they share their, their homes, their, their stories with us all the time. And of course, when it comes to fundraising, all of our fundraising is done on um, Facebook and T-shirt. I mean, everything's done on Facebook. Well, much. we promote everything. We promote on everything Facebook. on Facebook. We have a lot of direct donations through our website as yeah. well. But, um, but the community you get, from Facebook and Christina posts a lot on Instagram as well, but uh, it frees us up a little bit because we don't have to be the people with all the answers. We can often facilitate. So on our Facebook community, you know, on the community page, people will frequently ask a question and Christina doesn't necessarily have to just give the instant right answer because there's so many people with great experience where she'll share that question on the Facebook page. And that allows other people to jump in because what we learned a long time ago is that if one person is asking the question, there's probably a hundred that have it. Mm -hmm. And so people like to look through and they can see what others are asking. And um, 
And the other thing I think that, you know, our, our website and the Facebook page do the most of is there's that critical period that there's basically two things that can happen. A family can know they're adopting a deaf dog, but more likely they adopted a dog, a young puppy, and they find out it's deaf. They, it's just not waking up when they're slamming the door. It's not hearing the dog food, whatever it is. And almost invariably, and it's human nature, there's kind of this freak out. Oh my God, there it's is a, a deaf out. dog. And yeah. we felt it too. That's what we're trying to help other people yeah. through. So we share so many stories of other people and how, just take a deep breath. It's just a dog. I'm just going to communicate with it a little differently. And Christina hears almost daily emails. I got a deaf dog and I can't train it. It's like, yeah, you can. It, it, yeah, it's, it's fine. You just have, it's just a little different. And so I think the, you know, like I keep saying the redeeming qualities of Facebook where we really thrive on, oh, if I see that a thousand other people did it, I bet I can do it. I'm not the only one. There's a lot of resources. People are happy to Google. People are happy to read. We get a ton of traffic. Christina works really hard on writing so many wonderful articles on everything from watch me training, just you know, something as simple as you're asking about how you start training a deaf dog. With a deaf puppy, the first thing we do is we treat them for looking at us. And we spend weeks doing that. We condition you, them. You make eye contact with me, you get a treat. Because if you don't make eye contact, I can't ask you to do anything. I can't communicate with you. So Nitro, all our deaf dogs, they'll be out running around, but they're learning they're every 30 checking. seconds, every minute, they're looking over at us. Or are they going to be asking me? And so, so helping people walk through that, I think, is one of the neat things. And it just letting the community grow is wonderful. Who would, you know, deaf dogs are, you know, you buy a car and then suddenly you see that model everywhere, right? You know, when we adopted a deaf dog, it just wasn't even on our radar. And who would have thought that 75,000 people, has you know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of deaf animals out there. Wherever and, we go in the deaf yeah. dogs rock van, people come up and say, I have a deaf dog. I have a deaf dog. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot of people. It's, it's surprisingly common. It's... Yeah. These are, these are the good aspects of social media that I like to hear. They yeah. are. They're yeah. there. They're there. It's, uh... Emily did ask in uh, in the chat where they where people can find you on social media. Okay, uh, our, our pr primary is Facebook, so it's just facebook.com slash Deaf Dogs Rock, and our website, everything we own, everything Deaf Dogs Rock, so deafdogsrock.com, Instagram slash Deaf Dogs Rock, we're we're all where you'd expect to find us there, and. Um, that's probably the easiest to follow there. Join the community. And subscribe to our newsletter. Too. And yeah, we, we do put out a weekly newsletter you can subscribe to through our website. It's just a fun. Shows the new dog listings. That we post update stories. We like to do an equal mix of the stories of the dogs finding their home. We have a page of extraordinary deaf dogs where we highlight service dogs and military dogs and competition, and dogs. competition dogs that are all deaf and some neat things that way. So. Yeah. Um, Emily also asked, are there any um, kinds of donors that you pursue to support these shelters? We, we are very grassroots. We just, due to time constraints, we haven't pursued large we corporate pursued, grants. We haven't pursued anything. Yeah. Yeah. Christina no. works full time keeping yeah, the organization I just, running. I'm the IT guy behind the scenes and the graphics guy. And so uh, we, we are pretty successful, but you'd be surprised that whether it's a five dollar donation or a thousand dollar donation. Yeah, and we do. Donation, we get grants. We get in grants, and we don't even know. Like, yeah, we get in grants, and we didn't apply for them. We see a lot of people like doing matching grants with their work. We see people. Yeah suggesting us we've had quite a few trusts make donations that yeah. it's not uncommon for a trust to give them a, a certain amount of money each year to charities and people nominate who should that type of thing but, but I, um, I do think it has to do with we're very transparent so if you go under our donate button you will see our monthly success stories so we actually do a story on every single dog we sponsor into rescue so you know where every dime goes. So, and I think that has a lot to do with it. 
Yeah, in this day and age, we really want to be accountable. You know, we yeah. we volunteer. None of us pull any money out of it. We mm-hmm. want to keep the actual maximum percentage of every donation right. going to the deaf dogs, and uh, I think people really like that. It's yeah. Yet another question that came through about. Um, did did Marshall's TV uh, appearance change anything for your organization? <laughs> it was it was a fun boost for a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, we you know, it, it was we did some fun interviews. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how if or how I can measure long term change, but I can tell you, you know, we we just celebrated our tenth anniversary, and you know, this is what Christina does full time, and uh, she's ten years in, and it keeps us excited when you have different stuff like that. I think that's important to have some different things going on. And every time it's out there, it reaches a slightly different audience, yeah. right? And that's kind of neat to have to draw in a few extra people every time. Yeah. So if we had any viewers out there who were um, considering adopting a deaf dog, is there anything they should know about uh, that process and then you know, bringing them into their homes? Is there anything that you would share with them? I would say for them and, and most of the people that are considering adopting a deaf dog, they spend time um, under our resource section. They read as much as they can. We try to cover everything there. And then we have a, a video section where we have uh, positive reinforcement trainers showing you just step by step how to train. And that's like if you go and you go to our website, I have um, safety tips for deaf dog families. And it's photos of all the safety tips we have around the farm. I, we have a double fail system at, at every gate, at every door. So we have to make two mistakes for a dog to get loose. You have to make true. two mistakes. <laughs> and Not just the open door to the street, right? Yeah. So, so there's there are things to consider, but we try to put as much of that information yeah. on our website as we can. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, Greg, there, there's not that much that's different if it's going to be a deaf dog coming in. It's just other than probably being a little more intentional, you know, mm-hmm. thinking that's uh, so we see we do see a lot of repeat deaf dog adopters. They have one and they know the next one. I want to save a deaf dog. I want to I want to adopt one. And that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. You know, but we encourage everyone to consider it. You know, it's very hard to think of any downsides to having a deaf dog you know it's um it you you always want to make sure what group of dogs you're bringing any dog into so we talk a lot about that you know how do you introduce it and making sure that any dog is the right one to come in good match yeah yeah you know it being national um dog day i did want to put out there we do have a national deaf dogs rock day and that is on september 18th and if you um, just type in nationaldeafdogsrockday.com, there's a countdown calendar and it gives you all kinds of great things, ideas to do with your deaf dog on that day. And that is our fifth year uh, yep. celebrating that and bringing awareness. And yep. then that kicks off Deaf uh, Awareness Week. Yep. We've, been, sure. we've done a lot to, you know, we've talked about Nitro a lot, and if people don't know the backstory, Nitro is the dog we adopted, like I said, that started it, and he was with us eight years, so we lost him in 2018, which was sad, but uh, we, we do some special things that gave us ideas to start, start special days, and we have a special fund, Nitro's fund, that uh, goes towards specifically sponsoring white boxers, so into rescue, into yeah. rescue, yeah, and so. So, kind of branching off of that, uh, are there any ways that people are or who are viewing or out there who view this later are there any ways that those folks can help you guys i think you know i mean spreading the word spreading the fundraising you it, it's i don't want to just flat out ask for money i like to have fun with it right but you know one thing we do a lot of on facebook is people host fundraisers so for their birthday they do a birth and that's the facebook one of our largest sources of income right now facebook is fundraiser. people when you go on facebook it's very easy to do a fundraiser search for the name of the organization and we're accredited we're hooked with facebook so it's direct deposit they vetted us and that type of thing and then I think the other thing to do, and it's not just a deaf dog thing. If you if you want to make a difference, go to your local shelter or rescue. Rescue. I help mean, out. 
go walk the dogs, do oh, whatever. Wow. It's so good for your soul to donate be around the dog dogs. food. Because we we have a shelter outreach and we do yeah. donate a lot of dog food to our local yeah. shelters and rescues. So if, if if someone has twenty dollars and wants to buy a bag of dog food or yeah. you know or or biscuits for the dogs, we yeah. work with Angels of Assisi a lot and uh, we try to support them as much as we can. But I mean, if you're local here or you know, there's a similar organization like Angels, you can get approved as a dog walker and giving up an hour of your time to go walk the dogs. Again, it's great for you. It's great for the dog. And it so increases their likelihood, likelihood of being adopted being adopt because it calms them down. It gets them out of the shelter. We work on leash manners when we're yeah. walking. And so, so I mean, that's a play for it's, it's national dog day. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we can do to help dogs in need around the country. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to give one more cue to our folks who are watching right now if they have any other questions, just to type them in. But I think my other question for you guys is, do you have any plans uh, for the rest of the evening to celebrate International Dog Day? <laughs> We're going swimming. We'll go swimming. We, uh, <laughs> smartest thing we did, beautiful timing, right? Pre-COVID, we put a little pool in for ourselves. And so we love dunking the dogs and we swim in the warm weather. And uh, We have a solar heater, so we get it up to 88 degrees so we can swim at night. That's, uh, that's, 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 a, that's a good move. I'll, let's say all the dogs swim, but none of them swim voluntarily. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for, they like they they do like the warm water though we we never yeah. put them in cold water so yeah like you, know, you can see how tired marshall's rocking and his eyes closed he's had, he's had a fun-filled international dog yeah. day it looks like yeah. so, yeah. Um, every day is national dog day here let me tell you that's right. <laughs> Boy, so uh the other thing i would just remind folks who are, are viewing um if you follow our uh, alumni Instagram or Facebook, we are running a, a, a giveaway. So send us and tag us in your, your dog pictures from today. We wanna see your furry friends um, and you'll get a chance to win a prize from the Alumni Association. But um, closing remarks, uh, Chris, Christina, do you guys have anything else that you wanna throw oh, out thanks. there? Thank, thank you so much. This is, you know, it's a lot of fun, um, especially to connect with some alumni. It's, uh, I appreciate some of you that drop by and um, I've enjoyed and still enjoy my time so much at Roanoke. And uh, it, it is fun. Like I said, when I brought Lexi in, when I bring these dogs in, it, it's so immediately obvious how much the students miss their dogs and yeah. they're at home. They want to come see their dogs and uh, yeah. And it's kind of fun to connect. You know, this is a, a real passion for us. It fits in well. I, I'm blessed to have my job as a professor that gives me some time in the afternoons and evenings to support the organization and uh, to have an avenue to focus energy, I think is wonderful. And so it, it fits in really well. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. It's great to talk to you all. Thanks for having us. Yeah, well, we want to, we want to thank you guys so much for joining us and, you know, we appreciate all that you do for, for our community and the surrounding communities and all the people who are visiting your website and learning. Um, I know it's, it's, it's so informative and, and so great for, for what you guys do. But um, we also want to thank everyone who's joined us today. Yay, thanks um, for joining us. And if you want to visit roanoke.edu slash alumni and connect with our alumni hub, there's more information and upcoming events and some of our past events. So feel free to check those out. But otherwise, take care, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you soon, hopefully on alumni weekend this April. Thank you. <laughs>